Hello, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we've got a really exciting program today about a really great state. Uh, so we wanna thank you all for joining us and for those who helped advertise it um, on a couple of chat groups this week, we really appreciate that, thank you very much. So um, I'm Rick Harnish, I'm the Executive Director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. And uh, for those who are just joining us, uh, we are an educational nonprofit. We strive to be the place to get answers about uh, what high-speed rail is, why we should build it, what steps local leaders can take to make it happen. Um, and we provide the tools that you need in order to advocate on your own behalf so that you can make great trains in your communities a reality. Uh, we are supported by um, our members. So the people who are most engaged in getting trains for communities like yours um, are where we get our support. So if you want more trains, please go to highspeedrail.us and hit that donate button. Um, and uh, you can ensure that we have more great programs like this and we can talk about some other really exciting progress that's happening. Um, Chris Ott is on the line from Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, everyone. Um, he's, he's our deputy director working to get uh, good trains to Madison and Green Bay. Um, and he'll introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Rick. And uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, and let's talk about the state of Michigan, which is doing some important work for better passenger rail. Uh, Michigan is investing in the services that Amtrak currently operates, uh, along with exploring the potential for increased or expanded service. Uh, and we'll hear more details uh, about that from Peter Annister, the director of the Office of Rail for the Michigan Department of Transportation. Uh, it looked like Peter just dropped out here. <laughs> um, he'll be back, I assume. Um, we, were, we were chatting before the audience came in. Uh, I'll continue with his uh, introduction in hopes that he can rejoin us. Um, the Office of Rail's operations uh, include intercity passenger rail, crossing and safety regulations, safety oversight of light rail systems, and rail-related economic development programs. Uh, Peter Annister works to ensure that Michigan's rail system meets the economic needs of Michigan and is safe for the public, passengers, and railroad employees. He earned a bachelor's degree from James Madison College at Michigan State University and a master's degree in public administration from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. Uh, if you have a comment uh, today, please put that in the chat. And if you have a question, please use Zoom's Q&A feature. Uh, we'll have a question and answer period after the talk. Um, here is where I wanted to turn things over to Peter. Um, but uh, let's uh, let me, I'm going to go off camera and off the mic and just give him a call to see uh, what the what the problem might be. Uh, and we'll get going as soon as we can. Well, uh, sorry for the confusion. Uh, I give a little bit of background on what we're doing off the cuff. Uh, so we have three um, kind of guiding principles that we work on. Uh, the first is that if you want to do something that crosses state lines, which all passenger rail routes do for the most part, uh, it really needs to be a federal program with federal leadership because the, the local stat states can't see big enough of a picture in order to make the whole system work. So we're uh, working towards a uh, nationally guided rail program that has sustained funding um, over uh, decades. And we're excited about the big step in that direction that the recent bipartisan infrastructure law um, took and the, the re-engaging of local officials all throughout the country saying, what do we need to do to get passenger trains? So that's uh, very exciting progress in that direction. Uh, with more to come. Um, our second guiding principle is we need to have a high-speed line uh, defined as a place where trains can go at least 186 miles an hour. Um, we need, as the country, to have a high-speed line in operation so that Americans can understand uh, what the benefits are of the frequency, reliability, and 
in travel times that you get out of that. And um, I recently saw a great presentation by Brightline West making the case that they can have that in place uh, between Las Vegas and the LA Basin uh, by the 2028 Olympics, so just five years. And uh, given their track record in Florida um, and some other presentations that were built around that to discuss how they've laid out the logistics of actually accomplishing that, um, that's a very doable goal. So that, that makes me incredibly excited. Um, and then the third is you can't do a national program uh, without dealing with the last 50 miles into Chicago. And we really need to, as a country, figure out how we're going to do at least 50 miles of passenger dedicated mainline um, into the city. And uh, as a minimum and preferably figure out how to connect those, to, those together uh, in order to run trains through Chicago, not just to Chicago, and to O'Hare, which is one of the, the uh, most important airports in the country, and is really the connection for the entire Midwest into the rest of the world. Uh, so we call that Crossrail Chicago, and you can see the uh, poster in the background there. Uh, we're going to have some interesting announcements about that in short order. Uh, but we are also very excited uh, that Amtrak is taking a big leadership role in doing the first big steps towards that um, with what they call the Chicago Hub Improvement Program. And that includes two of the major components of um, Crossrail. One, uh, fixing and expanding Chicago Union Station and, and including platforms where you can safely berth a uh, run-through train. Um, and the other is what we call the Crosstown Connector, which is rebuilding the St. Charles Airline in order to connect Union Station to the Rock Island Line and to um, uh, either the Metro Electric or the CN Lakefront Line. So those are the two potential passenger dedicated routes out of the city, the Rock Island and the Metro Electric. Uh, and then to the north, you've got the UP North and the UP Northwest, which could be converted fairly easily. Um, and in the uh, first kind of go round or the first phase, we think that the Ogilvy Station and Union Stations should start to function as one, uh, so that maybe you walk into the Great Hall and you look at the train departures board in Union Station, and the one o'clock train to Milwaukee is leaving out of uh, the North Tracks at Union Station, the two o'clock train is leaving out of the Ogilvy Station, and then the three o'clock train may be out of Ogilvy and the four is back to, to Union Station, but for the customer, it all looks like one station. And it seems like they're far apart, but they're actually closer together than the two United Terminal buildings um, out at O'Hare. So uh, if we just had a, a connected walkway and in, in a unified construction plan, or uh, uh, operation plan, they would function as, a, as the same station. Um, so uh, for those coming, just coming on board, I see that some new people have joined. Um, so um, uh, I will, uh, uh, while we're waiting, that's a, oh, for the people who just joined, we've got a Zoom problem with our speaker, we're working it out. Um, and I just gave a little bit of background on, on our three kind of directives of, of how we choose to, to spend our time and advocate. Um, and if there's any questions about that specifically, um, our agenda or what we're doing, um, uh, or it looks like, okay, so Peter. We finished the uh, introduction. I gave a little bit of background on what we're about. Um, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully this will work in the, as we go forward. And uh, feel free to uh, take uh, to go ahead with your presentation. Yeah. So thanks for stalling for me, Rick. Can you guys hear me all right? Maybe give me a thumbs up. 
So right when Chris was about to, to launch his introduction, I just went went dark. I think it was a connectivity issue on my end here. Um, so I apologize for that, but um, thank you. I'm glad I'm glad to be here uh, a, a few minutes later than I was planning this afternoon, but um, excited to kind of give an update about Michigan and share some of the things that we've got going on and um, hopefully get a chance to, uh, to address any questions that I'm not able to hit on during my presentation. Um, I did put some slides together. I think it um, hopefully gives you a little bit of a picture of some visual things that are happening in Michigan, but um, you know, hopefully we can get things going here. All right, so I thought many of you probably are familiar with Amtrak and passenger um, you know, systems we have in Michigan, but in case someone's not, I thought I'd just give us you know, a brief snapshot of our routes here in Michigan. You know, starting on the western side of the state, uh, you'll see a, a green line that uh, reflects our Pierre Marquette route uh, that runs between Grand Rapids and Chicago. Uh, we basically have, you know, one round trip service a day currently uh, on that route. Uh, moving uh, over to the east, you'll see a, a blue wall, a blue line that is reflection of our blue water route, which uh, runs from Port Huron, Michigan, um, over on the east side of the state uh, into Chicago as well. And we have one round trip service a day on that route. And then finally, our uh, Wolverine service, which is the, depicted by the red line on our uh, on the slide, uh, which is a service from Pontiac, Detroit, um, into Chicago as well. So we have uh, three round trip services currently on our, our Wolverine service. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a snapshot of our current services. Um, you know, essentially five round trips a day. Um, and uh, we serve um, essentially about uh, in the typically, you know, before COVID, we were serving about 800,000 passengers a year. Uh, you'll see on this chart, you know, it was fairly stable between June 2013 and, um, you know, 2019. Uh, you'll see the dip due to COVID. And then uh, last year, 2022, uh, we did start to see some recovery. Uh, we are seeing that again for, for 2023. I know our ridership in April was about 14% higher than it was in April of 2022. So I don't think we're going to get back to our pre-COVID um, in 2023, but we're still certainly trending in the right direction. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can uh, get back to that point soon and then continue to kind of grow our ridership into the future. Um, but there's a little bit of snapshot of our ridership. Uh, the Wolverine is our, I guess, our most um, ridden train. You know, part of that's due to the number of frequencies we have, um, and then the Blue Water Service, and then uh, at Pierre Marquette as far as kind of ridership ranking. I thought I'd share a little bit about um, some of the projects we've got going on in Michigan. And, you know, we've really strived to make a lot of investments in our services, um, really with the goal of um, bringing higher speed trains uh, on our services, especially between Detroit and Chicago. And that goal is really driven by, you know, making, uh, you know, train travel a, a reliable um, and really competitive uh, when you're looking at time compared to, to taking a car. And a lot of the uh, investments and vision we had is, you know, how do we do that on the I-94 corridor between kind of Detroit and Chicago? Um, so we've made a lot of investments. It started with this original grant, an ARA grant uh, back in, you know, the 20, 2010, 2011 range. Um, and that allowed us to uh, draw down uh, quite a bit of federal funding to really rehabilitate, rehabilitate the track to bring it up to uh, classic standards for higher speed trains um, and do kind of all those necessary investments to bring uh, reliability and, and you know, build the infrastructure we needed. 
I'm excited to say that we uh, have officially closed this grant this year. It was a, a long time in the making, um, working with FRA and, and through those processes, but uh, this year we were able to uh, to officially close this grant. So that was a, a big milestone for us here in Michigan. And then in about 2018, um, we started to get a little more aggressive in, in looking at, you know, what still um, needed to be done with our infrastructure. You know, how do we maintain the services as we have? How do we start to prepare uh, to grow services in the future? Um, and we've been pretty aggressive and pretty fortunate to, uh, to continue to be able to do projects um, to draw down support um, through federal grants um, for a lot of work on the uh, on the Michigan line and other projects throughout Michigan as well. Um, this grant was kind of started in 2018 um, with a state of good repair grant to do rail and cross tie and track resurface rehabilitation between Battle Creek and Dearborn, and then work on the replacement of two bridges right in downtown Jackson. Um, that are really just west of our, our Amtrak station in Jackson. Um, I can say the, uh, the tie work on this project has been completed. Um, that finished last year. And the bridge work started last year and will uh, essentially be completed by the end of this year. Um, so hopefully the plan is sometime in, in August that will drop these new uh, bridges into place in, in Jackson um, and get that project completed by the, uh, the end of this uh, fiscal year here. Another grant that we got was um, a 2019 State of Good Repair grant, and this really focused on um, continuing to make some improvements with track and signal infrastructure, um, you know, backup generators, switch heaters, um, keep improving on some gate mechanisms and some turnouts. So again, this is to uh, to make sure that we're, you know, maintaining and improving the infrastructure we have to really bring, you know, that day in, day out reliability to our service. Um, you know, generators and, and switch heaters, again, is to, buy, to provide some resiliency as well in our um, operations. Um, so this will be uh, an important grant to, uh, to try to do that and, and start to move some of these projects forward. We have been working with FRA for a few years on this grant. It was, um, we finally were able to get this obligated this spring. So uh, we're moving forward on, on starting work on this project. Uh, the first phase will be to kind of replace 10 turnouts. Um, so that's work that um, is ongoing and hopefully will be um, completed this year, and then you know next year and possibly into 2025, we'll we'll get the rest of this project completed, uh, really based on um, you know resources availability and, and other projects that we have going here in Michigan. We also in uh, 2020 were awarded a, a Chrissy Grant, uh, really for uh, trespass prevention. And um, unfortunately, in Michigan, as you know, along with you know many other communities, we we do have um, a lot of uh, areas where there's more activity around the tracks than we would like. So we wanted to uh, to put forth uh, a grant and really to make some investments in um, trespassing prevention and you know, making sure that we had kind of appropriate separations between um, our tracks where we are running trains at, you know, pretty high speeds um, and to keep really, uh, you know, citizens off the tracks as much as we can. Um, so this is a trespass prevention grant. It's really um, focused on um, activities throughout the Michigan line between, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, Dearborn and Kalamazoo on our ownership of that line. There are uh, intentions to really do um, improvements to fencing and some select grade crossing improvements as well. We are starting our work this year um, in Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor and, and Albion are kind of our uh, phase one communities. And we've uh, done a lot of uh, design and development work on those projects. 
and uh, we're hopeful that we can get started on, on some of that work this year as well. Um, phase two will be um, other communities, Battle Creek, Kalamazoo, uh, some more of our kind of rural parts of our, our routes as well. Um, so this will be a multi-year grant as well, but at the end of it, uh, we're hoping to have uh, a, you know, a safer um, Michigan line and um, hopefully less uh, interactions with public that leads to, uh, to kind of really tragic results. We're also uh, making some further investments and some curve modifications. And um, this is a project that's gonna happen between Jackson, which is right in the middle of the state of Michigan and, and Ypsilanti, uh, which is to the east uh, down by Ann Arbor. Um, this project is necessary to kind of complete the infrastructure work to make sure that we can run trains um, at the maximum speeds possible for our routes. So um, you'll see there's quite a few curves that still need to be modified. This is a pretty pretty curvy part of our, our route. Um, so we have been awarded funding for this grant. Um, it is, you know, I think, uh, you know, something that is going to be uh, an improvement and again, help us to maintain that reliability and, and maintain uh, existing infrastructure. Uh, this is a project again, that's, uh, um, we're hopeful to get, you know, moving forward on this year as far as construction. Uh, I think at the moment this fall, we're looking to do, um, to begin some of the curve modifications. Um, that's something that I think will have a little bit of an impact on our, our services starting probably in, in August when we kind of robustly get moving on this project. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we'll have some good improvements. And again, this will hopefully improve our um you know, our reliability and, and uh, make some improvements on our, our time as well from our run times between Detroit and, and Chicago. Uh, so this will be an important project as well. We were also awarded uh, funding through a raise grant to um, help with the cost of constructing a new uh, station in the new center part of Detroit. So the station there now is, uh, uh, was built in the 90s as a temporary station. Um, you know, here we are 30, 30 plus years later, um, still using that temporary station. So the state um, owns some property, both where our existing station is and then to the south of the tracks there. And we are going to, um, in partnership with our passenger transportation team, um, really built a multi-functional um, facility that will host Amtrak trains as well as inner city bus um, and really have better, you know, connections to local modes of transportation as well. Um, if you're familiar with this station, it's right on Woodward Avenue. Um, the light rail, um, the Q line runs right, uh, right adjacent to our station on Woodward Avenue. Um, so we're really in the process of uh, looking at how we're going to design the station, you know, how we're going to, you know, meld it into the community and, and really connect all these different modes of transportation. Um, currently, we're looking at uh, an opening sometime in 2026 or 2027 um, for the station, but we're actively working on that project now to, uh, to really get to uh, um, you know, complete designs and visions and, and move that project forward. And then we were also successful recently in getting some uh, PE NEPA funding to, uh, to reconstruct five deficient bridges on our uh, Michigan line corridor. Um, so we did again this year, um, we have been awarded the PE NEPA. We did apply for, um, I guess, the follow on funding for final design and construction of four of these bridges as well. But again, this is an effort to continue to improve that, that infrastructure on the Michigan line so that we can make sure we've got that reliability and um, you know, run times that we're looking for um, throughout our service. So that's uh, uh, another one that we've been awarded and we're working with FRA on now to, uh, to work to get that grant obligated. 
So that's a little bit of uh, kind of some of the work that we're doing on, on our routes that we own. Um, Michigan's a little bit uh, unique because not only do we own rail, um, Amtrak owns some rail in Michigan as well um, that runs between Kalamazoo and, and Porter, Indiana. Um, and then for our Pierre Marquette and our Blue Water routes, we run on host railroads. Um, so we really have a good mix and an interaction with um, with our host railroad partners, with Amtrak, uh, with lines that we own here in Michigan. So it, it certainly makes for a kind of an interesting mix of um, projects and how they get done and, and how we kind of try to move projects forward. I will talk a little bit about uh, our venture cars. So uh, with Michigan in partnership with Illinois, Wisconsin, and Missouri, um, basically purchased our own rolling stock. So we have 33 new Charger locomotives that are currently in service now on the Midwest Amtrak service. Uh, we are in the process of um, and purchasing and, and putting into service 88 new venture passenger rail cars as well. So those were uh, also purchased in partnership with the Midwest States and Amtrak. Uh, you'll see here those makeup of, of those cars are 54 coach cars, um, 17 business class cars, and 17 cafe cars. Uh, we currently have um, 52 of those in revenue service. I think by next week, I think we'll have 54 cars in revenue service. I think we're, we're close to getting two more cars um, in final acceptance. Um, so most of the um, coach and business cars are going to be in service by uh, this fall. Um, and then we'll have the cafe cars, uh, which were always intended to kind of be the, the last cars that are going to be placed into service. Um, we may have a couple of those that we get here by the end of the calendar year, but it's really anticipated that most of those cafe cars are going to be um, delivered by Siemens uh, in 2024. Um, so um, I, I'm excited to say that we did get delivery of our the last three business cars that Siemens was uh, manufacturing for us out in California um, just a couple of weeks ago. So all of the coach and business cars are are have been delivered, um, and now we're just working with Amtrak to get those cars into into revenue service. You'll see here's a, a picture of the Charger locomotive and and the Venture cars. Um, you know these do have a lot of uh, improvements from our previous cars, which uh, a lot were the Superliners or Horizons. Um, you'll see the you know much bigger windows, much better Wi-Fi, much better uh, connectivity and, and some amenities. Uh, we've got bike racks that are part of these cars. Um, they're, you know, nice wide aisles. So there's great um, ADA accessibility um, on all our cars. This is a picture of the business cars, which are, um, you know, two seats and one seat. Uh, the coach cars have um, two seats on each side. But um, if you haven't got a chance to ride the venture cars, and um, if I could see you, I'd probably ask for a raise of hands of who's had a chance to do that. Um, I know I took a trip recently to Chicago a couple of weeks ago on the Blue Water route and um, rode on a venture car, and um, it was you know a great uh, I think improvement from from some of the horizons and and really time to get some new equipment. So I wanted to spend a little time too talking about some you know future opportunities. Uh, we are looking to continue to improve our service uh, here in Michigan, both from a reliability standpoint, from an on-time performance standpoint, um, really from a runtime standpoint, um, really trying to get you know a reliable um, you know competitive service is is really a big goal for ours. We did recently apply for the new FRA Corridor Identification and Development Program. We submitted, um, I guess, requests to include all three of our existing routes in that program. And the purpose of that is to really to continue to make uh, improvements on those routes, um, but also with the goal of adding, adding frequencies. 
Um, so that's something that is uh, is a vision of ours. We'll we're, you know, kind of waiting and see where um, you know what FRA does with kind of these initial rounds of uh, of submissions. But you know we did submit all our routes with with that intention. We also, as part of that process, um, have proposed to look at extending one of our um, Wolverine frequencies with service into Canada. So um, initially, I think the vision here is to connect, um, you know, through the CP tunnel in Detroit um, to Windsor and the Windsor station and um, then work with VIA to um, essentially use their network to, uh, to get trains to Well, it looks like we've had another uh, disconnection. Um, I will uh, uh, jump in again. I assume, Chris, that you're dealing with trying to. So did you guys lose me again? We did lose yeah, you again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for getting, getting back so quickly this time. <laughs> All right. Um, at what point did I drop off, I guess? Last I remember, I remember thinking, well, how do you get to the Windsor Station from the tunnel? So it must have been right around there. Right around there. Okay. Um, so, you know, looking at, uh, I guess, can you guys still see my slides? Am I still sharing or do I need to redo that? Yeah, you do need to redo that and probably turn off your camera. Okay. Let's stop that. Reshare my screen here. So, Rick, maybe give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides. Or so it says, uh, corridor development improvements to south of the lake. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with my connection today, so. But apologize for that. So, yeah, so I think we're looking as um, part of that corridor ID um, proposal to extend one of our Wolverine services into Canada. Um, so, as you know, Rick mentioned looking at, uh, you know, connecting through Windsor initially. Um, there would have to be, to, to Rick's point, some, some improvements made on the Windsor side um, to get to the uh, Windsor station. Um, but I think there's been a few kind of preliminary discussions with Transport Canada and and Via Rail um, to see how the possibilities of that. So that's something that is uh, we're looking to do in the future here as well. We also applied for, um, I guess, the Ohio Rail Development Commission actually submitted, but in partnership with us for a Detroit Toledo Cleveland route. And as you know, for all our routes basically are, um, you know, go to Chicago. So I think if you want to go east, you kind of got to go west before you can do that. And I think we've got some visions of how do we actually um, connect people eastwardly without having to go to Chicago. Um, so connecting through D Toledo to Cleveland, I think would then be a little bit of a, a gateway and opportunity to, uh, to connect our routes eastwardly to, um, you know, essentially Washington, D.C., New York, and that sort of thing. So I know Ohio has been um, maybe not as active in, in passenger rail, but it sounds like they are starting to become more active, and um, we've worked with them a little bit on that. And then the other big piece is really for our services is improvements to south of the lake. So um, all three of our routes basically run on Amtrak um, lines till Porter, Indiana. And then we uh, take host railroad um, lines into Chicago, essentially. And there's a lot of railroad traffic there, um, certainly a lot of activity. So I think it's, um, 
you know, for us, it's probably one of the, the areas where we find the most um, issues um, ensuring that our we have that reliability and, and performance that we're looking for. So the good news is, um, you know, I think there's a lot of stakeholders that are interested in this as well. I know I recently had a call with um, both Amtrak and FRA um, to talk about South of the Lake. And I think it's on everybody's radar screen that there's still work that needs to be done to really um, improve this area and, and really improve um, the ability and infrastructure um, so that we can have, you know, good passenger rail service through that segment of our routes as well. And then we're also, you know, going to continue to seek uh, federal grant funding for projects and um, continue to look for ways that we can improve our services. You know, some um, examples of that is that uh, in partnership with Amtrak, we have um, applied a couple times now for a double tracking project in Southwest Michigan. So this would be between Niles, Michigan, um, and it's north going north for about 16 miles. And um, it's a project that's on Amtrak's owned uh, portion of lines here in Michigan. So they're really uh, taking the lead on that project. Um, they have included it in a couple recent um, federal, I guess, grant submissions that they've sent. Um, so that's something that would help improve, um, again, efficiency, efficiency and train meets that are happening in Southwest Michigan. And again, just kind of help improve our overall operations. Um, Amtrak is embarked now on some, um, I guess, goals of improving you know, not only Chicago Union Station, but some projects in and around um, Chicago as well. Uh, so we've been uh, working with them and in discussions for how that might impact Michigan's routes, um, as well as all the other Midwest routes. You know, that includes improvements to Union Station, to some of the platforms at Union Station. Um, I think they're also looking at, you know, facilities and projects um, for tracks that go into Union Station. Um, in partnership with some of the uh, host railroads as well. Um, so again, while not directly in Michigan, all of our trains certainly touch base with Chicago Union Station. So, you know, that's something that's going to be important for us as well. And then we've also are partnered um, with MIPRIC, which is the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail um, Commission and Amtrak and the other Midwest states on seeking some funding for some overhauls in our charger locomotives. Um, so that's something that uh, we're in the midst of doing as well in partnership with those groups. So with that, with a you know couple of hitches there in the presentation, um, that's a little bit of kind of what's going on actively in Michigan now and um, some of the things that we're continuing to think and, and work on in the future here as well. Great. Uh, yeah, this was really good. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess if you stop sharing your screen and we'll try turning your camera back on. Okay. Um, and I'll give you a second to figure that out. There we go. Okay. So um, I don't pay attention to the statistics, but it seems like there's been some reliability issues um, on, on the three routes. Um, and I know that we've gotten a lot of questions about that over the last week. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what needs to happen to, to fix it? Or even if it is a real issue? Yeah, so, you know, our on-time performance definitely is not where we want it to be. Um, so we've been working with Amtrak and talking with um, some of our host railroads on trying to identify, you know, what those reasons are. Um, I think we've made some progress. I know on the, the Pierre Marquette's probably our best route as far as reliability and on-time performance. Um, it's a little bit mixed on the blue water and it's really mixed on depending on the frequency on the Wolverine. Um, so that's something that we've made, I guess, a much higher profile for 
for Michigan to really understand like what is going on, where are we running into issues? Um, you know, some of that I think is is Amtrak operational. Um, some of that is probably freight freight interference as well. Um, so I think you know, in the short term, I think we'll continue to work with Amtrak to identify, you know, what what are things that we need to be doing to make sure that we have that reliability. I'd be frank, there's probably some infrastructure improvements that need to be made south of the lake to help just release some of that capacity. Um, you know, some of those are probably going to be more long term, but, you know, we are meeting with, um, you know, the host railroads to try to talk about, you know, reliability and performance and, and make sure they know that this is important to us and, and kind of what our expectations are. And, you know, one of those big things is, I'm, I've not confirmed this, but it appears that they have to operate, the Norfolk Southern has to operate the bridge over the Calumet as a single track bridge, which uh, on a busy freight line like that is probably a real issue. Yeah, there's definitely a couple pinch points on that route, Rick, over, over a couple rivers. Um, and, you know, we've talked with NS a little bit about you know, how, how that might be looked at in the future. So, um, but I don't, I think we want to look at everything and, and not just make an assumption. It's, there's one issue. Um, I think we want to just make sure that in order to provide that kind of consistent reliability that, that we're addressing um, all the types of issues that come up, you know, we, we do sometimes have PTC issues that, that come up, um, so again, I think we're looking at, you know, what's the root causes of some of those things and how do we, you know, how do we try to uh, eliminate those things in the future? Excellent. And then, and so you talked about Toronto and Cleveland, um, but it seems like there would be a lot of travel between Grand Rapids, which I recently heard was, you know, continues to be one of the really strong growth spots in Michigan. Then you've got Lansing, the capital. And then Ann Arbor and Detroit. Um, the uh, Michigan Environmental Council and uh, an MPO, the Grand Rapids MPO, led an initial feasibility study of, of purchasing that railroad from the CSX and running something like regional rail on it. What's the status of that? Yeah, that until recently, that hasn't uh, there hasn't been much movement on that since that study was completed, Rick. Um, I can tell you that there's been some recent discussions. We we call that the coast to coast route here in Michigan, um, and kind of that Grand Rapids to to Detroit route. Um, and one thing that's been really interesting, we've got um, you know with we've got term limits here in Michigan, so we had a kind of a new array of legislators that came in this year. And we've gotten a lot of questions and a lot of interest um, really from places we haven't necessarily had that before. Um, so I think it's, you know, these questions of, you know, what does the future hold for routes in Michigan? Um, you know, where does it make sense to make those investments? And that's certainly one of the routes that, that people are certainly talking about right now. Um, we did not submit that route for this round of the corridor identification program. But I think obviously that's going to be an annual um, opportunity. And, and that may be one that we look at in the future of, you know, seeing what are the next steps to, to look at that route and, and the feasibility of it. Yeah, I assume, I have no information. I just assume that Chicago, Detroit has been on people's minds for long enough and connects enough places that we'll, you'll get that first grant for that one. But uh, it would probably be good to follow up with that. And then on a similar vein, there's Traverse City, uh, which a nonprofit from up there is leading. Um, what's the next steps on that round? I forgot what the AIDS. Yeah, the Ann Arbor to Traverse City. So. Um... Yeah. There's a group called Groundworks that's based in Traverse City. That's kind of the nonprofit that's really um, focused on that effort. Um, that project has actually been able to secure uh, a couple million dollars of funding, both from the feds through a raise grant and then from the state um, appropriations process to really develop a service development plan for that route. 
Um, so that's, you know, kicking off this fiscal year. Um, and that probably is going to take, you know, 18, 24 months to get that work completed. Um, but there's been a lot of work on and some studies done on the vision. And this, I think, will really allow them to take the next step to, to develop a true kind of service development plan to understand, all right, what, you know, what upfront capital investments need to be made to make that happen? You know, where, you know, where would this route potentially stop? Um, you know, you know, who's gonna, you know, who's gonna operate the route? Um, you know, there's some governments, governance questions there that need to be answered. Um, and then obviously the, the big one always is funding, right? Um, you know, how, how much is it going to cost to, to pay for any upfront capital and what's it going to be, you know, operationally year in and year out to, to fund that route and, and where's that funding coming from? Um, so that's, uh, I'll say that one's in progress that they've, they've got some funding to do that and, um, uh, we'll work through that process and then, um, you know, see where we're at with, uh, with what they kind of find out and, and unearth through that process. Um, I assume that the infrastructure cost is less than a major um, uh, interchange uh, <laughs> and, and the operating cost is less than the cost of doing uh, mowing and such uh, on uh, US 31, but I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know that there's uh, any proposals to build a new highway directly on that route, but there, as you mentioned, there is some existing infrastructure there for highway side. So, um, you know, this would certainly be a, an interesting opportunity. And then, so then the, the the real challenge with that one and the across the coast to coast is that connection in Ann Arbor, which is just tough. But then that leads to Ann Arbor to Detroit um where there was a commuter rail discussion which unfortunately was only talking about like three trains in to detroit in the morning and three out but it seems like if you could put these together um in one package so the traverse city the the coast to coast and the wolverine and you had regional rail in all three of those you could have really frequent service to ann arbor to detroit and really do something exciting in that corridor do you think that's how do we get that discussion started? Do you think? Yeah, I think you know we look a lot to the you know some of the regional agencies down in Southeast Michigan. So there's Simcog, which is our you know Southeast Michigan Council of Governments. You know we do have an RTA in in Michigan. Um, the challenge we face is that that RTA is the regional transit authority has never been able to successfully um, get a millage approved for the counties that it serves. Um, so they haven't, you know, really gotten the funding backing um, to really truly serve as, an, as a regional transit authority in Southeast Michigan. Um, and I think that's kind of been a little bit of a, a headwind to some of these commuter rail discussions in Southeast Michigan and, you know, looking at who's, who's kind of leading that effort and, and what, uh, you know, what the priorities are. Um, so I think that's a, a big piece of it. Um, you know, how do we go about really, you know, looking at what the needs are in Southeast Michigan and, um, you know, what funding is going to be put into place. But, you know, like you said, there, you know, there's there's infrastructure there. Um, it, it's not all tied together perfectly. Um, there definitely would have to be some additional investments that would be made. Um, but I think for us, it's really understanding what are are those priorities and and how do we start to, to move forward on some of those visions. Okay. And I, I think we're we're gaining momentum and hopefully we can really speed this up. I want to go back because you're talking about the infrastructure issues in Detroit. One of our board members made a comment that um, the Detroit station is pretty close to an Amshack. Um, but somebody told me it actually is an Amshack. It's two trailers that are disguised as a building. And is that... Is that right? It was, a, it was a temporary station built, you know, in the, in the 90s. 
Um, so yeah, it's, you know, we, there has been some recent investments there, um, especially around, you know, kind of ADA issues and that sort of thing, but it is definitely, um, past its, its useful life, um, and is, is being band-aided. So I think that is something that you're, you know, we're definitely, you know, in progress on, on replacing that station. You know, just a little bit of bragging. I had a meeting with Secretary Mineta in that station when he was secretary and they were on their Let's Zero Amtrak tour. Um, and I caused Mineta to say something on camera that got the people in Montana and in North Dakota really riled up, which uh, made it easy to deal, uh, easier to keep that funding as opposed to getting it cut. So well, I have fond memories of that stage. Yeah, you know, I we've got, you know, we've had some investments in some new stations, obviously, you know, Dearborn, East Lansing. Um, We've, we've got some older stations on our routes as well. I know there's discussions for, you know, stations potentially. I think we recently chatted with Port Huron. I know Ann Arbor's got some visions for, for a new station. Um, you know, so I think there's, you know, definitely that's an important part of the that ecosystem. Um, and I think that's something we'll, we'll continue to be involved with those local communities as well as, as they're looking at how do we how do we connect our local communities with Amtrak and and use our stations to kind of play a role in that connection? Yeah, the Battle Creek sta uh, station is a great e example of that. But we're uh, hopefully with the delays, we can. Can you stay a little bit later? Yeah, for sure. So I know we had a couple of hitches there. So I want to be able to get through some questions here for sure. So uh, what do we have uh, in terms of questions, Chris? Oh, we have so many, um, and thanks for making some extra time here, Peter. Um, you know, we still can probably only get to a few, but let's let's go. Um, uh, Kay asks uh, or points out that the Michigan Senate's uh, fiscal year twenty four budget proposal includes a hundred a hundred million dollars for grants to encourage high speed rail development, uh, but providing matching funds that local governments uh, need to qualify for federal money. How will your office work with those communities in developing projects for funding? Um, well, 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 that's exciting. I think it's a little premature to know what the Senate's ultimately going to do for our budget. So, um, you know, for us, any money that gets added through that process, which is not completed, is really defined by the boilerplate requirements they put on those that that funding. So, I guess, to be honest, I don't really want to speculate of what might be in or what might not be in the budget um, until it's actually completed. But, you know, to my comment earlier, I think, you know, happily, there's a lot of interest and support in our, our legislature and from our current administration for passenger rail. So I'm really hopeful that 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 support's going to translate into some funding that allow us to kind of continue to uh, to look at passenger rail and, and develop that. Um, but what that may look like at, you know, when the final budget is signed by the governor, I, I think that's still kind of a wait and see. Okay, thanks. And uh, a couple of related questions. Kathleen asks, are there any high-speed lines in planning stages currently? Well, that's always that 100, that, what, do you, what does she mean by high-speed lines? <laughs> so, on our Wolverine, we, you know, we're operating up to speeds at 110, um, you know, except for those routes where, or portions where we're doing some modifications still. Um, the, you know, Pierre Marquette and Blue Water, are, you know, those are on host railroads. So I think, you know, there's no immediate vision to, to go above 79 on, on those routes. You know, if you're you're talking, I think Rick is always the vision. You know, 200 mile an hour trains is kind of Rick's vision. I think um, we haven't had, you know, to be frank, a lot of discussions of how that you know would occur in Michigan. You know, obviously, I we've got lots of at grade crossings in our state that would have to be um, dealt with if we went to kind of a closed um, system that was running at those types of speeds. Um, and while I I think that's a very amazing goal to have. 
Um, I think more of our short-term goals is how do we how do we ensure reliability and um, you know on-time performance and those types of things for for the routes we're running now and and how do we continue to kind of expand expand service and and frequencies for people to uh, to kind of experience the train and provide that as a as a auto alternative here in Michigan. Um, so the super high speed stuff I think is a you know for us I think is more of a a longer term vision. Okay. And uh, uh, Mark Hoover, one of our board members who comes from Michigan originally, uh, asks you. Well, you you had mentioned uh, the the hope of uh, reconnecting service to Canada, and as part of that, is there is uh, does that include connecting to the emerging uh, plans in Canada for high speed rail or high frequency rail, or do, does that work on the Canadian side need to get further along? Yeah, to be honest, I'm not super familiar with the Canadian side of, of what their visions are, but I think anything that we do would certainly be in, in partnership with VIA. Um, so if if we can leverage and take advantage of the investments and visions they have on, on, on what's going on in Canada, we certainly want to try to connect with that and, and use that to kind of better and improve our service as well. Um, I'll mention I've seen a couple comments here too on, you know, Michigan Central Depot, um, which is you know a separate train station in, in Detroit that Ford is is bringing back to life, and if if we do have service that you know connects through the CP tunnel there, um, it's you know basically right at the the back door of Michigan Central Depot, so we have had some discussions with with Ford about Michigan Central Depot and, um, you know, the potential of having a, a station, you know, there or part of that campus. Um, so we've had, had some of those discussions and uh, I think that they're willing to be a, a partner, have been kind of supportive in that. Um, so I think that's really, really promising as well. <laughs> We have, uh, as uh, as often happens in these talks, we have a lot of questions about when service will come to particular places, or you know, people interested in in, in better service for where they live or where they want to go. Uh, so I'll I'll get to a few of those. There's there's too many. Um, uh, but um, let's see, is the if if in on the Wisconsin side, if it's possible to add service to Green Bay. Wisconsin, uh, could there be an extension that runs up into uh, Upper Michigan from there? Yeah, I think Wisconsin is actually looking at um, a connecting service into Green Bay. I, I believe you may know better than I do, Chris. You're based in Wisconsin, but um, I've heard that you know talked about a little bit. You know, I think we would you know be open to that. Um, obviously, we'd have to partner with. With Wisconsin to, uh, to do something like that, um, I can say that you know it's, it probably hasn't been one of the routes that's been high on the list of things I hear, but that's something we can certainly add to the list as well. Okay, and you'd mentioned uh, in your talk the uh, the the ambition to improve, or will you? you the, the corridor ID applications to get into Ohio. Uh, and Aaron asks, uh, did the Ohio Rail Development Commission participate in the application? Yes, they actually were the ones that submitted the application. So they were very active in, um, in working with us and, and partnering. So I think that's a really good sign for, for the future. OK. And what about the airport? Is there a possibility of creating a connection from the Detroit Metro Airport to the, the nearest Amtrak station? Yeah, that's, you know, the airport's been discussed in a lot of the, the commuter routes. I think even, um, you know, what routing you would take if you did a Detroit, you know, Toledo, Cleveland kind of route, um, you know, could something like that in, include the airport? You know, I think, you know, for us, we uh, we, we kind of look at things as, you know, inner city rail and then commuter rail. You know, I think for connections to the airport, you know, I think that to me at least falls a little bit more on the commuter rail side. You know, you want to have that, 
you know, really frequent kind of continuous service to make to make that successful. Um, but I do know that's been a lot of the discussion in Southeast Michigan and, you know, how do we make that connection with with the airport and, um, you know, make that part of that discussion for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you, is, is there anything that you can say about plans for additional frequencies at this stage, or does that kind of depend on the corridor ID process? Yeah, I think that would really depend on the corridor ID process. Um, you know, so I think FRA has been um, really focusing on that process and trying to leverage that to gain an understanding of, you know, what projects need to be done to kind of continue to expand passenger rail service in the U.S. And we definitely want to be be part of that process and and fully engaged with them and, and that vision. Um, so I think that is really going to drive, um, you know, some of those discussions and, and some of those, you know, I guess, decisions. The other thing that I think will be a big, you know, I guess, uh, you know, item to be worked out is the, you know, availability of equipment. Um, mm -hmm. So it may be that you can increase frequencies without, you know, much more strain on your existing equipment. Um, but if if you do have to to procure new equipment or add new equipment to do that, um, right now there's just an extremely long lead time to to do that. So you know I think that's going to be a big determining point as well as you know how long is it actually going to take to get equipment to be made available to to expand routes even even when all you know sides have have come to an agreement to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And related to equipment and frequency, you mentioned, Lawrence points out that you mentioned that increasing ridership is a goal. What's the, he asks, what's the realistic capacity of the venture cars uh, allocated to Michigan for, for increasing that ridership? Yeah, I think um, right now it's, it's pretty minimal because we haven't placed all those cars in service. So we don't have a lot of, of wiggle room. Um, you know, Michigan's frequencies, like, I think typical on a lot of them, we we have higher ridership on the weekends than we do midweek. Um, but I think our hopeful our hope is that once we can get all our new venture equipment into place, that that'll give us a little bit more flexibility, maybe to to add cars on on certain routes when we need to do something like that. Um, so I think that is kind of the most near term opportunity where we see uh, an ability to to kind of maybe you know, bump up opportunities to increase ridership. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll get those cars into service by by this fall. And, um, you know, that'll let us have a little bit more flexibility in working with Amtrak to, to do some of that when when necessary. Mm -hmm. It certainly is the, the availability of cars and um, some of the, the issues we've had in getting the ventures into service is certainly I think impacted our ridership because we just sometimes haven't been able to meet that demand necessarily and, and had to make some adjustments on routes. Okay. And speaking of flexibility, we have a, a few questions about the shared tracks that the passenger trains in Michigan use. Uh, Roger and David ask which companies own the tracks that, uh, that the, the state doesn't own for passenger rail. And then Kathleen asks, uh, what, what is being done or can be done to alleviate issues between freight and passenger travel? Yeah, so we work with a variety of host railroads. So the Pierre Marquette runs a lot on CSX lines. Uh, the Blue Water runs, you know, primarily on CN lines in Michigan. Um, Norfolk Southern is the host railroad that we run on kind of between Porter, Indiana and Chicago for the most part. Um, and then Southeast Michigan, I think we, I think we touch almost all of them at some point. So um, CN, Conrail, um, CSX. So Michigan is, as far as dispatching, we're actually, you know, a fairly complicated state of how many of the different host railroads we have to work with. Um, and then can you repeat the second half of that question? I think it was Kathleen, you said. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, what is being done to alleviate issues between freight and passenger trains? Yeah, so again, Amtrak's got a pretty robust system of identifying, you know, causes of delay. So their engineers, you know, basically have to, to track that. Um, so we're looking at, you know, what, what, you know, what are we being identified, be it, uh, you know, an Amtrak issue from the origination point, be it, a, you know, a PTC um, connectivity issue or a freight train interference issue. Um, you know, we're seeing probably the biggest culprit still is, is freight train interference, which, you know, leads you to believe that, you know, when we get down to, to some of those NS lines or other, other areas that, um, you know, are being held up or slowed down by, by freight trains. Um, but I think we're trying to dig a little deeper because um, ideally that schedule works best when your, your passenger trains arrive when they're supposed to arrive. Um, and I think we need to make sure that, you know, we're looking at, you know, is that happening as well? Or are we kind of missing missing our marks a little bit on our operationals to to hit those freight trains when we're supposed to? Um, so we're looking at everything. Uh, we really want to try to to have a better understanding of that. Um, I think obviously the the surface transportation board is is putting a lot of pressure on the freights to to be good partners in in passenger rail service. And I think to be honest, we've had some you know, some good conversations with the freights. Um, but we'd certainly, I think, still see some areas for improvements and and want to continue to work with them to, to really significantly improve our on-time performance. Okay. Do we have time for a couple more questions about speed and power? Sure, we've got a couple more minutes. Okay. Great, thank you for staying on a little longer again, and to everyone who's uh, who's sticking with us in the audience. Uh, so back to the the 110 mile an hour trains that you have running. Jim asks, how much have the higher speeds reduced Chicago to Detroit trip time so far, and what's the eventual trip time goal? Yeah, so our goal is for the Wolverine to get under six hour runtime. Um, we've had some significant improvements when we. We closed out that original ARA grant. Um, that, I guess, runtime reduction was um, above 30 minutes. So all those improvements that have been made to, in, to increase speeds and other infrastructure changes, um, you know, really had a significant impact in that regard. You know, the, the future investments we're making, um, Again, each one of those is probably a little bit varied in in that you know runtime improvement. Um, but you know, doing something here, doing something there, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot. But then you start to add up a few things, and all of a sudden you got you know 12, 15 minutes again lopped off your runtime. Um, so that's something that's important to us. But you know, that ultimate goal is you know six hours. Um, you know, I think you know, we want to be, you know, competitive with someone, you know, getting in their car and driving, essentially. Um, we're probably not going to get exactly to, to that point, but we're hopeful with, you know, not having to drive, not having to pay for parking, gas, um, that there's a few other intangible benefits and, and quantitative benefits for people to, to take the train as a, as a good option. Okay. And then uh, about power. Um... Is there any consideration of electrification uh, for Michigan's trains, especially on the, the the lines that the state owns? Yeah, nothing short term. I mean, we've made some pretty significant investments in these charger locomotives, which are fairly new. Um, you know, I think everyone's looking for how do we how do we improve sustainability and and everything we do in our you know environment. Um, so I don't think it's, you know, certainly off the table at any, you know, at some point in the future, but, you know, for now, I think we're, you know, we've got our charger locomotives, they're, they're fairly new, um, you know, so I think that's where our focus is at the moment. Okay, and then last question is not about uh, power for trains directly, but the person power that makes this happen. <laughs> 
Uh, how do you do this work? Um, essentially, Kevin asks, how large is the rail office's staff? Yeah, so our office in total is about 35 people, um, but the part of the office devoted to, to passenger rail is uh, just a small portion of that. So we have, you know, I'll say three or four people. We do have um, other regulatory functions that we're responsible for here in the Michigan Office of Rail at um, crossings. We do obviously uh, work with freight rails as well. Um, so we've got some programs and services that we operate with, with freights as well. And then, um, you know, we own track, not only the, the Michigan line, but we also own about 500 other miles in Northern Michigan, kind of our more low density freight services. So we've got the responsibility to, to maintain that track as well. So, um, so while those, the, the total staff's 35, most of those people are, are focused on other functions than, than our passenger service. Well, this all sounds like a lot of work for the the three or four people who you know really focus on on passenger rail. So thanks to that team, and thanks especially to you for for being here today. And uh, just before I turn things back to to Rick, um, we had a couple of questions about whether we can get uh, slides, if that is possible. You know, we'll we'll share those. But either way, we we will have a recording of this talk available in a few days. And in fact, we have recordings of all the talks, several dozen, uh, probably about 50 actually, that we've done over the last several years at our website, highspeedrail.us slash events. So you can watch this or any of them anytime you'd like. And uh, thank you again, Peter, and thank you all. And well, thanks everybody, appreciate it. Thank you, uh, this has been great. We really appreciate it. Um, for those again who stuck with us, thank you very much. And if you would like to see more of these, Go to our website and we'll send you a, a t-shirt, highspeedrail.us. Scroll down a little bit and you can see a place where you can get your, your t-shirt. So thanks again, Peter. And we look forward to riding faster and more frequent trains in Michigan soon. Yeah, absolutely. Go ride the train, everybody. Absolutely. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.